The Ruth Page School of Dance is a platform for developing great artists and connecting them with both audiences and community. The school's Summer Dance Workshop is a two-week program for beginning dancers ages 7 to 14 with no audition required. Register now at ruthpage.org. Dance friends, and welcome to the Dance Edit podcast. I'm Margaret Fuhrer. And I'm Courtney Esquine. It's just the two of us today. We are editors at Dance Media, and in this episode, we'll be talking about how both the 100th anniversary of the musical Shuffle Along and the birthday of tap legend Bill Robinson, which is a date also recognized as National Tap Dance Day, fell this week. And we'll look at the tight ropes that Black artists like Robinson and the Shuffle Along creators had to walk. We will briefly discuss the trailer for the new documentary in Balanchine's classroom and some of the reactions it has provoked on social media. We will break down Lil Nas X's joyfully, maximally queer performance on SNL with its instantly iconic wardrobe malfunction. And then we'll have our interview with Sienna Lalau, who at... 20 years old. I have to keep reminding myself she's 20 years old. (laughs) She's already become one of the industry's go-to K-pop choreographers. And Sienna talked about what it's like to work with massive stars like BTS, and also about why commercial dance generally and K-pop specifically deserve greater respect, and especially from the concert dance community, which here, here to that. Um, First, though, we want to say thank you To all of you who've been tuning into this podcast from the beginning, we so appreciate you all. And we also want to welcome those of you who might be new because we have seen a little surge in listenership recently. So hello, new dance friends. Um, If you have a minute, please do subscribe to the podcast on your listening platform of choice and give us a rating and review if you're so inclined. Let us know what you think. All right. Now it's time for our weekly dance headline rundown, which is my personal first dance headline (laughs) rundown since Courtney and I are doing our duet today. Let's go. All right, so in Broadway reopening news, Hadestown has jumped to the front of the pack. The most recent Tony winner for Best New Musical plans to raise the curtain again on September 2nd, nearly two weeks earlier than any other show that's announced a reopening date so far as we're recording this. Uh, Cadence and I were actually texting about this, and she pointed out that there's something like really right and perfect about Broadway coming back with Andre DeShields asking the audience, all right, and I like... (laughs) Yes, that. That's what I've been waiting for. That does. That does feel correct. Yes. (laughs) Um, The reality series World of Dance is back or sort of back. Uh, NBC did cancel the Jennifer Lopez produced show back in March. But this week, the new social platform Display has revived World of Dance. It's airing a five episode showcase version of the series. And those episodes have been airing nightly in the app. So you can catch the last two of them tonight and tomorrow night. Uh, In a bit of a turn for sad news, uh, Verndell Smith, the founder of Ultimate Threat Dance Organization in Chicago, was shot dead a few blocks from his studio. The 32-year-old was remembered by his family and the families of his students as a uniquely caring teacher who wanted to make his studio a safe space for the children he taught. His motto was, stop shooting and start dancing, which... Oh my gosh, the whole thing is so heartbreaking. We'll include a link to some coverage of that story that provides a little bit more context and a little bit more information about who he was and the work he was doing. Uh, Last week, the Tony and Emmy Award winning performer Billy Porter revealed in a piece for The Hollywood Reporter that he has been HIV positive for the past 14 years. And Porter actually said that playing the HIV positive character, pray tell, on Pose helped him, quote, work through the shame, unquote. Um, You need to read the story if you haven't already. It is searingly candid and no summary is going to do justice to Porter's own words. So we'll link to that in the show notes too. Yeah. Uh, The Joffrey Ballet announced its 2021 through 22 season, returning to live in-person performances at Chicago's Lyric Opera House. Uh, The season will kick off in October with a mixed bill featuring the live performance premieres of works by Chanel De Silva, Nicholas Blanc, and Yoshihisa Arai. Also of note is the long-awaited premiere of Kathy Marston's Of Mice and Men in April, which was meant to debut in February, but was postponed, of course, due to COVID-19. 
Yeah, Emma Joffrey's whole move to the Lyric Opera was delayed by COVID too. So that, yeah, that'll be interesting to see as well. Well, friends, it is a lifetime holiday movie announcement time. It is Christmas in May, and <laughs> this year the lifetime holiday slate will include a Christmas dance reunion, which is a typically on the nose title for a film that is reuniting high school musical stars Corbin Blue and Monique Coleman. I mean, Chad and Taylor dancing together again. I'm all the way in for this. It just sounds wonderful. I like, well, absolutely a little bit ironically tuning in, but also I just adore Corbin Blue. Uh-huh. So yeah, actually, actually very little irony in my enthusiasm. I'm just <laughs> fully a fan. <laughs> yeah, he's wonderful. Two wonderful performers. I can't wait to see what this turns out to be. Uh, And in more Hollywood news, Warner Brothers has announced a new movie musical project titled Wonka, depicting the early years of famous fictional chocolatier Willy Wonka. The film will star Hollywood darling Timothy Chalamet, who his reps confirmed will be singing and dancing in the movie. There's no word yet on a choreographer or lyricist, though David Hyman, being a producer, seems like a fairly good sign. Uh, The theatrical debut is slated for March 2023. Margaret, we had very different reactions to this news wildly different reactions. <laughs> well, I think they overlapped in the fact that we were both like, <gasps> like literal jaws dropping. Yes. Um, but my, I was mostly enthusiastic, whereas you have some reservations. I do. I Listen, I love Timmy, but like Gene Wilder's performance is so iconic and such a perfect thing in and of itself. I don't know why we need to go back and do a prequel. I kind of feel the same way about Emma Stone playing Cruella de Vil when we have Glenn Close playing Cruella de Vil so perfectly. Like, this is just me. New narratives. New narratives. <laughs> we don't need to keep rehashing old properties. We can do new things, but... I understand that, but I also have faith in Timmy. I think he'll make something great out of it. Oh, he's going to be wonderful, I have no doubt. Just, you know, my caveat. (laughs) All right, making a hard turn now into some very sad news. The dance world lost two luminaries on the same day this week. Samuel E. Wright, who was probably best known for voicing Sebastian the Little Mermaid, but who also had an extensive Broadway career. He originated Mufasa in The Lion King and William Sheridan in The Tap Dance Kid. He actually replaced Ben Vereen as the leading player in Pippin. He died of cancer at age 74. And then Anna Halperin, the revered dancer and choreographer who our own Wendy Perrin called the mother of American experimental dance and who also explored ways to use movement as a tool for healing she died at age 100, although she always, I mean, she seemed immortal. I almost can't believe she's not here anymore. Unsurprisingly, there have been tributes to both of these artists all over social media, and we'll link to some of the obituaries in the show notes. Uh, and looping back around to Broadway, uh, in news that broke right before we sat down to record, the Tony Awards have finally set a date. The ceremony will take place on September 26th, almost a full year after nominations for the abbreviated 2019 through 2020 season were announced. It's expected to be live and in person, but only the awards for Best Musical, Best Play, and Best Play Revival will be broadcast live on CBS. The program will primarily be a starry concert of theater songs, according to the New York Times. All other awards will be presented in a two-hour ceremony immediately prior streaming exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. Uh, it's an interesting model. It's four-hour-long Tony Awards, but you have to go to two different places to see all of it. I mean, look, this whole process has been so bananas, I'm kind of just glad they're happening. But the injustice of not letting network TV viewers witness Aaron Tveit getting his Tony Mm, that feels wrong. Yeah. I mean, at least at least Jagged and, and Moulin Rouge and Tina will get their their performance moments in prime time. So yeah, and there's and they haven't really announced yet what uh, other performances we're going to be seeing. So I I have faith we're going to get to see a lot of cool stuff. I'm still holding out hope that Moulin Rouge gives us like the Act Two opener because it's so dancey and wonderful and magnificent. But we'll see. It does seem Tony's ready. Well, yeah, much to be seen. So in our first discussion segment today, we want to recognize and then tie together a few different milestones that happened this week. So first, May 23rd, on Sunday, was the 100th anniversary of the groundbreaking show Shuffle Along. It was the first all-Black musical to become a hit on Broadway. And then Tuesday, May 25th, was the birthday of legendary tap dancer Bill Robinson, known as Bojangles. It's a day that we also now celebrate as National Tap Dance Day. 
And May 25th was also the one year anniversary of the death of George Floyd. So for multiple reasons, this felt like a moment to think about the complicated negotiations that Black Americans have had to make and continue to have to make to survive, to survive in show business, but also just to survive, period. Let's start by looking at Shuffle Along, because this was a show that, I mean, it helped usher in the Harlem Renaissance. It brought jazz music and dance to Broadway. It showcased Black excellence with this virtuosic singing and dancing, but it also provoked some really complicated reactions. Yeah, so starting with sort of like the upsides of Shuffle Along, it was completely groundbreaking. It was an all-Black team of creators showcasing incredible dancing, incredible singing. It was a smash hit. It played so many performances. It lasted way longer than was typical for the time period on Broadway. However, uh, it also featured Black performers in blackface, which is a strange thing to contemplate. In some ways, it can be looked at as a reclaiming, a saying, okay, if white folks on Broadway are doing this anyway, let's beat them at their own game. Uh, Mm -hmm. It was also playing primarily to white audiences. It had a white producer team. It's been said it hasn't really been successfully revived in a very long time. And a lot of that has to do with a lot of the humor is deeply uncomfortable to listen to and probably was as a black audience member at the time would have been deeply uncomfortable to listen to as well. Yeah, there's a great NPR piece about the show's anniversary. And they talk to historian Cassine Gaines, who points out that the creators of the show, they knew that to market it effectively to white audiences, which they knew would be primarily the audience for a Broadway show, they'd have to buy into some of the minstrelsy stereotypes that have been popular on the vaudeville circuit that had proven to work with this audience. I mean, and I think we have to also mention that, of course, George Seawolf and Savion Glover revisited Shuffle Along in 2016 with their brilliant sort of like half revival, looking at the making of the show, and that unpacked some of this mm-hmm. baggage. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it is important to recognize that when the show debuted in 1921, there was nothing else like it on Broadway. Like it really helped create a new type of musical and pave the way for shows like West Side Story and yes, Hamilton. And it also it brought jazz to Broadway, which, Mm -hmm. you know, for like, I think mostly for better from an artistic perspective, but there were so many white composers who ended up taking what they learned from this show and what they were inspired by from this show and applying it to work. It's also kind of problematic in its own right. However, yeah. from a purely artistic perspective, it did contribute to the evolution of Broadway into what we see today. Right. So a lot of artists have also expressed conflicting feelings about Bill Robinson over the years, um, because though he's known pretty much universally as a phenomenal boundary-breaking tap dancer, He's not always thought of as a social role model, but three of today's most esteemed tap stars, that's Dormisha, Derek K. Grant, and Jason Samuel Smith, who are all incredible, just premiered a new dance work about Robinson called The Mayor of Harlem. And it celebrates not just his dancing, but also his sort of behind the scenes style of activism. Yeah, uh, in our Mitgang, who co-wrote a biography of Robinson uh, in this article that appeared in the Washington Post, talked about how... He was fighting for equality in his lifetime, but he did it very quietly. He did it behind the scenes. To quote him in this article, he was smart enough to realize that if too many whites realized he's breaking down this barrier and breaking down this barrier, he would be out of a job. So Mm -hmm. he played by the rules of his time, quietly pushed where he could push, did it behind the scenes, and kept doing the work, essentially. Yeah, and talking about the pushing that he did do, I mean, his civic contributions, for example, he was a really engaged community supporter. He performed in benefits. He did charity work. Those are the kinds of actions that earned him that honorary mayor of Harlem title, which is where the title of the show comes from. And he also would insist on integrated audiences at benefit performances he was involved in. Which was not the norm by any means. That was not the norm, especially in like Dallas and Memphis. He was doing this. It's, mm-hmm. That's totally not the norm. But yeah, there was this acknowledgement that having a more prominent presence as an activist would probably cost him the platform that allowed him to help in a meaningful way. So anyway, Courtney and I, we're not tap experts. We're not tap history experts. We will link to the NPR piece about Shuffle Along. We will link to the Washington Post story about the mayor of Harlem so you can learn more there. But 
it's important to revisit and reconsider this history as we think about the type of dance world that we want to build going forward. And there's, of course, a lot of that happening right now. Uh, so speaking of reconsidering history, hmm. in our next segment, we're going to get into the new trailer for the documentary in Balanchine's classroom, which dropped a few days ago. Actually, we're not going to get too far into it because it is just a trailer. We have not yet seen the film. Often filmmakers have very little to do with their trailers, so it might not be a complete representation of the full documentary. But this thing provoked some heated reactions on Twitter. Um, and as people who are deeply invested in ballet and invested in rethinking how ballet's story, particularly when it comes to its like quote unquote great men, is told, we just couldn't not talk about it. Yeah. So I think, as Margaret said, worth noting, oftentimes the people who cut trailers aren't actually the people who made the films. However, I do want to point us to the synopsis that's provided by Zeitgeist Films, part of which reads, uh, quote, it takes us back to the glory years of Balanchine's New York City Ballet through the remembrances of his former dancers and their quest to fulfill the vision of a genius, end quote. Everything about the language of this does to me, and I think to a lot of people, reek of that lone genius mentality, which we see so much and which we pretty much only see applied to straight white cis men, and historically has been used to cover up and excuse poor behavior, which you do not have to look far to see further discussion on this. Literally around the trailer, uh, so much Twitter discussion was happening about okay, but are we going to talk about the mistreatment? Are we going to talk about the relationship he had with a lot of his dancers? Yeah. The tone of that blurb on the website is also very much the tone of, of the trailer. It's it's sort of uniformly positive. I mean, can I... Some direct quotes from the trailer of dancers talking about being in rehearsal with Balanchine. I thought I was going to throw up. I'm going to fall down dead. I went from questioning to believing to being a disciple. Yeah, it's a little culty. It's a little I mean, culty. I... I am someone who personally feels a deep affinity for Balanchine's work. Mm. Like, I fell in love with it as a dancer and as a viewer growing up. Like, my dance childhood was spent watching VHS tapes of those 1970s, like, PBS Dance in America specials mm. until the tape wore out. And I remember learning the variations. I specifically remember learning the divertimento number 15 variations and that one that like and and thinking like the internal logic of these steps is so right like this is what it feels mm. like to be the music you know so the idea of this documentary is of course appealing to me and i understand the impulse to deify the guy to like right off the bat because the good is so good and also, like, from a dance historical perspective, like, looking at the footage that's in here, I can't wait to oh watch the gosh, footage yeah. from the rehearsals and things, because everyone who worked with Balanchine directly, he was so much a choreographer who was very much creating on the people who were in front of him in the room, and he had such a specific and intriguing way of describing what he was looking for. So from that perspective, I, I cannot wait. I think there's going to be yeah. such insights here. And they've, they've promised us a bunch of unse previously unseen footage, which is, yeah, of course, that's exciting. But like, yeah, haven't we learned at this point that we cannot responsibly teach another generation of dancers that Balanchine's treatment of women especially was just the price to pay for his genius? Like, we cannot only share the voices of those who support him unconditionally. And also a more nuanced take on his legacy would be so valuable. Yeah. Like, again, it's that idea that we just keep coming back to on the podcast of, can we please learn to hold multiple ideas in our heads simultaneously? Like, Balanchine was a brilliant teacher and choreographer. Balanchine's treatment of dancers, especially women, was extremely problematic. Both of those things can be true at once. Yeah. Um, anyway, as we said, this is just a trailer. Here's hoping that all this worrying we're doing ends up being completely unnecessary. And they, they do show a more complex portrayal of of what Balanchine was actually like, what working with him was actually like. Here, here. All right. Finally, we want to discuss another news item that we could not not take a minute to hmm. obsess over. Um, that, of course, is Lil Nas X's internet breaking performance on Saturday Night Live over the weekend. Actually, he did two songs on the show, but we're referring to his performance of Montero, which was his first collaboration with choreographer Sean Bankhead. That is just a match made in dance heaven. 
And the two of them use dance to celebrate queerness in a way that still, I mean, even in 2021, you just don't see that much in pop music. So before we get into the whole like wardrobe malfunction part of this and all the craziness <laughs> in the week leading up to this performance, because it was, it was from the bonkers, sounds of it, bananas. Yeah. I just, uh, watching this, it makes me think about how when we have talked about queering the dance vocabulary, we've talked about a lot in the context of ballet, because ballet has been pretty much the slowest to get there. But when we talk about mm-hmm. queering dance vocabulary and having a more... Uh, for lack of a better term, egalitarian approach, expanding the colors in your tool chest, not just saying, okay, this is, quote, feminine movement, this is, quote, masculine movement, uh, really allowing everyone to access everything. Watching this, the sensuality of it without getting hung up on gender norms, Mm -hmm. oh, it just, it just hit different. And I loved it so much. It was just beautifully choreographed beautifully performed so sensual so well just everything about it there was never a point where i'm just like oh they're they're trying to be feminine they're not being feminine or oh they're like doing the cliche of masculinity it's like no this is just a complex look at sensuality that is ignoring gender norms and Mm -hmm. just mm, just yes i'm running out of words i'm so into it what's so great about lil nas x I mean, it has been for a while, but this performance just kind of epitomized it, is making what used to be implicit in a lot of pop performance explicit. Mm. Like, it's not that queer culture hasn't been influencing pop music for decades. Of course it has. It's been everywhere. But it's looking back on, like, especially boy band history, for some reason, that's where my head goes. There was always this overtone of like, yeah, we're stealing from all these different parts of culture, but like, no homo, you know, Mm -hmm. like, they had to prove their heterosexuality. Lance Bass could not be gay, you know. And now it's recognizing all those contributions in a way that's celebratory. You're not you're not hiding behind anything, including, unfortunately, in this case, his own pants, which (laughs) I mean, look, <laughs> he covered it like a pro, literally covered it like a pro. It it made it meme worthy, which kind of got the performance more more exposure in a way that I think ended up being great. Exposure. Huh. Oh, my God, I can't. I'm, I'm not even doing it intentionally. <laughs> well, and I think also like uh, it was quite cool because he ended up going uh, and doing an interview of Jimmy Fallon and they showed a video of his dress rehearsal where he actually did like the move on the pole he was supposed to do and it was so impressive and also just kind of proved like this was not a stunt this is what the choreography was supposed to be also mad props to those dancers because apparently the day before filming uh, one of the cast members uh, in that dance crew tested positive for COVID the entire cast had to isolate including choreographer Sean Bankhead, they had to get completely new dancers, rehearse them remotely, not having the choreographer actually there. And like you watch this video, they are so on it. They are so rehearsed. They know exactly what they're doing. Like mad props. Yep. I mean, long story short, there is like dance people are the ultimate professionals always. Mm -hmm. And also Lil Nas X and Sean Bankhead collaborations forever. Just forever. Yeah, this is my new favorite dream team. (laughs) All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we will have our interview with Sienna Lalau, so stay tuned. Hi again, dance friends. I am very excited to be here now with commercial dance phenomenon Sienna Lalau. Hi, Sienna. Hello. Nice to meet you. Thank you for having me today. Thank you so much for joining today, for making time. Um, Sienna is... 20 years old. And that's a fact that I have to keep reminding myself because her resume is already so extraordinary. Ah, thank you. <laughs> she, she has earned national recognition for her work with The Lab, the creative arts studio that you may know from the show World of Dance. Recently, she's become a go-to K-pop choreographer. Her choreo for BTS earned a video music award last year. And she's also created Dance for J-Lo and Sierra and Missy Elliott. She has had this meteoric rise. Um, but before we talk about all your professional successes, Sienna, can you actually start by telling us your dance origin story? Like how and when did and why did you first fall in love with dance? 
Absolutely. Um, for me, I was actually surrounded by music all of my life. My dad used to be a DJ back in the day. And when my mom was pregnant with me, she used to go to all of his events and everything. And, you know, when you're pregnant with the baby in your belly, of course, the baby's going to hear the music playing from the loudspeakers. <laughs> so I remember her telling me this story where she would always go to his events and she would feel me kicking in her stomach to the beat. And <laughs> I felt like she always, she from I think from that moment, she kind of knew that I was born to do something with music. And mm -hmm. once I was born and like from the ages, I would say like one to three, I was just running around the house, always singing, always dancing, like whenever music was on. Um, and even when music was off, just like constantly moving and couldn't keep still. And so my mom knew from that point that I was born to be a dancer. And she put me in dance classes right away at a studio that I live that I lived uh, kind of close by. Um, in Hawaii, that's where I'm from. Mm -hmm. And so I started my, my dance journey there, learned from all these amazing teachers uh, at a studio called Hyper Squad back in, uh, back in Hawaii. And I don't think it wasn't until I was probably around my teens, around like 13 or 14, where I like started to notice that like you could actually do something with dance. And um, meaning that like, you know, I think at that time when I was a teenager, like I guess YouTube was starting to become a bigger thing, like posting dance videos on YouTube and mm -hmm. seeing all these like videos um, just get mil millions of views. I was like, oh my gosh, like there's a scene out in LA. Like I was so sheltered for most of my life that I didn't even know that that was a thing. Um, so I would always watch these videos on YouTube and always see these amazing dancers on social media. That's when Instagram started to like start coming up and I was like oh my gosh I want to go there and I want to be a part of that scene so um from there I would tr like I would travel out to LA every now and then I would say like that about like every two or three months out of the year to just go train and take classes from like so many choreographers and teachers that I look up to and then it wasn't until I did like this dance uh competition with the lab the team the lab uh, back in 2016 and um, from there, we built that relationship together. And then, um, yeah, everything just started kind of falling into place from there. I moved out to L.A., started to choreograph a lot more and become um, a little bit more interested in choreography and while still taking class and, and learning from all these amazing choreographers out in L.A. And then, um, lo and behold, started posting more of my own choreography on YouTube and on and on Instagram and social media and started to gain so much recognition from all around the world, which I'm so blessed and so thankful uh, to have at the end of the day. So how old were you when you actually moved out to LA? I was, I was 17. You're 17, 17 years old. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you've Not only that been out far there. Off. Yeah. 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 Just two years <laughs> ago. That's crazy. Yeah. So let's, I want to talk about the lab because it's been such a formative part of your dance life. Absolutely. Um, so first of all, can you actually just explain what the lab is? And some of our listeners might not be as, as familiar with it. Absolutely. People are probably like, mm, what's the lab? <laughs> <laughs> um, the lab is a dance studio uh, out in West Covina, California. Um, we're kind of turning it a little bit with a little bit more into like a creative agency now. Right. Um, but for the most part, it is a dance studio. Uh, and it's been around for, I think, over 20 years now. It's kind of gone through different names. It's under the direction of an amazing director named Valerie Ramirez and uh, also managed by my manager, who is my manager now, Carrie Calkins. And we do all these competitions in the dance community, the SoCal dance community. And uh, that's when we join World of Dance. and one that TV show. So yeah, it's basically a dance studio, but now turning into a creative agency where we can bring in lots of new talent, whether it's barbering, music, uh, creative design, anything. So did you say yeah. barbering? Yes, we have a lot of amazing, talented people around the studio that are friends with Alan Carey that we all kind of collectively come together and bring our talents and skills together to do all these fun projects and jobs together. So dance studio plus. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and and how did the lab, how did being a part of that family sort of shape you as an artist? I would say it changed pretty much my whole life, changed my perspective, my mentality, um, just even my motivation to like get up and want to dance every day. That was definitely, the lab was a big part of 
I think the lab is a big part of who I am. I come from a small island, you know, and I was always so used to just being more on the chill side of of things because everybody in Hawaii is very laid back. You know, we love to just live as life goes on and just ride the 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 wave um, as much as we can. Um, but I felt like when I started to dance with the lab and when I started to work with the lab, felt like a shift in my uh, mentality and and mainly in my hustle changed the most. Mm-hmm. Um, just knowing to like, oh, it, you, like if I really wanted to do something or, or succeed in something, then I had to get up and do it myself and not let my uh, comfortability take over too much. And so I think the lab has shaped me in that way so much. Um, and just, I've always, I, I feel like the lab has such just supportive and genuine people that I'm always surrounded by that have always supported me in everything that I've done. And so I'm just really thankful for each and every one of them because they've, oh my gosh, they've made me the woman that I am today for sure. And you've grown up so much as an artist over the past few years. Can you talk a little bit about how your creative process has evolved during that time since you started this like snowballing process of booking job after job after job? It feels like you really found your voice. Um, I think with every job that I've done, I feel like I learned something new every single mm-hmm. time. And I always find something that I'm not so strong in every single time. <laughs> you know, that process has been so amazing to to watch, but also very stressful to be under. Um, it's been a, it's been an interesting, like, growth process, I would say that I've had. But I think that the people that I'm, that I'm always surrounded by, and the, the people that I work with are always the, the pluses to it, you know, it's just being inspired by that and being motivated by the people that bring uh, their energy and their uh, commitment and their dedication towards towards everything is like, it's such a rewarding feeling. Yeah. Yeah. The support system that helped you get through that like crucible that was forging mm-hmm. you. Yeah, exactly. Oh my gosh. Um, so I especially want to talk about your work in K-pop because you went from like K-pop fan to respected K-pop choreographer yes. <laughs> so quickly, so quickly. Um, well, first of all, what draws you to that art form? Where's Where does your affinity for it come from? I've always kind of been a fan of of K-pop um, ever since I was, I would say in middle school. I started listening to K-pop when I was like 12 or 13 because my cousin introduced it to me. And I loved the way it was just so colorful, so vibrant. Um, and even though I didn't understand a word they were saying at the time, it was just the fact that their music videos felt like it always had so much life in it. And um, that's something that I connected to right away. It was like the fashion that they had, the music makes you feel good, the beat and the the vibe that you get from it is just so, it's so childlike, but in like a, like I was saying, it's just very vibrant, very full of life. And so I think that's why I liked it so much. Yeah. I know what you mean about almost a, a like a childlike quality to it. It's that sense of like earnestness. Like there's yes. no cynicism in it. It's always like full throttle. Like we mean exactly. what we're saying. Right. Mm-hmm. Which is so, yeah. Yeah. There is, there's such an appeal to that, especially right now. I feel like after this year, we all need more of that. Oh my gosh. I totally feel that. So how did you initially get involved as a choreographer in that world? What was kind of your breakthrough moment? I think for me, I posted a lot on my Instagram and while social media has definitely played a big part in helping me get the jobs that I have today. Um, you know, I think the networking of it is so special and the fact that I've been able to post a lot of my videos of my work from just like working with the lab or, or even choreographing things on my own and posting it on my social media. I think that's what probably gained a lot of attention, um, to these companies. And so I remember, Uh, being hit up once to choreograph for a boy group named EXO. Mm -hmm. Um, That was my first time ever doing a K-pop submission, like in my life. And I was so stressed because I wanted it to be so good. Mm -hmm. And they ended up using some of it or using like the concepts of it, which was really, really cool. Uh, And then we did, the lab did this competition called By Juniors. And we did like this whole production set up with like uh, risers and gates and chains for dogs I don't know it was like a full-on crazy performance um, lab is always full out always oh, always always <laughs> the most <laughs> um but 
I think after that we put after that video got posted, that's when BTS had hit me up or hit the lab up to have me choreograph to their song Dionysus, which they wanted to use all of these props in it, like a moving table, chairs, a staff, like they had they wanted everything in it. And it was about like the the Greek gods are like having a dinner at the table or the last supper. I think that's what the mm-hmm. the um the theme of it was. And so I was like, well, I just choreographed for, you know, the lab, like doing all this production stuff. So I think I can do it. We did it. We sent it in. They loved it. They used everything. And from there, they posted the their video of their, their performance. And I was able to kind of share it on my page. And from there, I think that's when their army, their fans, they were all like, oh, my gosh, you choreographed this. It's so crazy. Like, the production level of it is insane, um, which I'm so thankful for them, by the way. The army fans are definitely so dedicated. And, oh, my gosh, they are so supportive of everything and so yeah after I choreographed that for them I was able to choreograph for a little bit more k-pop jobs on the side for other groups after that and then it wasn't until they hit us up again um back in I think it was like November of 2019 to turn in a submission for uh on uh Mm -hmm. that music video that we were able to be a part of and so from there I sent in the submission and because they loved the way the dancers executed it so much they wanted us to be in the music video ourselves so um oh my gosh like things just blew up from there and obviously COVID happened right after that which is such a oh such a sad feeling to be on such a high and then now go back to down exactly um um but from there I was so blessed because there were so many k-pop companies reaching out to me um I especially just from that asking me to choreograph some of their their new comebacks and their new songs that were coming out. So I was able to do, I think, like close to 10 different K-pop comebacks in in the year of 2020 alone, which was so um, just such a blessing, especially because, you know, the world got on the world was put on pause and the world Mm -hmm. got shut down. And so to be able to still be working, it's just crazy to have a job after everything got shut down. So I didn't know that story that BTS already had in mind. They wanted to use those specific props. And you were like, yes. I can do that. The lab has exactly. taught me how to do that. Yep. I, I'm, your, <laughs> I'm your girl. Um, exactly. That's so great. I want to talk a little more about working with BTS because, I mean, once once you work with BTS, all of K-pop comes calling. Um, Absolutely. But so how do, you, how do you choreograph for this group that is, first of all, so famous, so huge? And mm-hmm. second of all, it has there's so much diversity in their movement aesthetic. Right. Um, for me, I, I'm obviously a very big fan of theirs. I've always been a big <laughs> fan of theirs. So I, I would say the the 13 year old girl in me was definitely screaming a lot um, inside when I first heard that they wanted me to choreograph for them. Um, but, you know, I think whenever I work with artists, um, I like to just think of them first as human beings and, you know, and, and not put so much of the the pressure of them being a star on top of myself, just putting this mindset on myself that like, okay, they hired you because they believe in you and, you know, they, they want to work with you. They know what you can do. So it's time to pull up. It's time to show out and, and not be afraid and not be scared of, of showing them who I am through my choreography. But for them to, especially like you said, they have such a diverse movement uh, range and like what they do. And I grew up listening to them and I also watched all of their music videos. uh, So I know what they're capable of doing. And so for me, I wanted to think of things that maybe they haven't done too much of in their their past uh, songs and try to bring a different energy and a different vibe that would fit the, the song that they wanted me to choreograph to trying to think of ways to elevate their movement and think of different things that they haven't done before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Rather than sort of playing the greatest hits in terms of things they've done. Yes. Um, So a lot of our listeners are from the concert oriented part of the dance world. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes that community tends to write off commercial dance generally. And k-pop in particular as like Mm. unserious quote unquote like oh that's fun that's not serious dance (laughs) which is clearly wrong but can you what would be your 
personal argument against that? Like, what does that perspective on this industry miss? I think dance is just meant to be a form of an expression, right? And so Mm -hmm. I can see where the the concert dance world wants it to be serious. Um, But I think the one thing that dance is able to do, the superpower that it has is that it brings people together. It unites people. And it's it's something that's very fun, something that's very um, pure and something that's very raw and it's in its own self. And so I can see where they... They probably look at the industry and the K-pop, um, just the K-pop world as unserious, um, quote unquote, unserious. Um, but I think that they make waves in the community. They make waves mm-hmm. in the world. And, you know, they're also bringing together people of all different backgrounds, all different origins, all different styles. And so personally, I think that, you know, the K-pop and the uh, commercial industry is definitely serious because it makes impacts. Yeah. It makes impacts on people. Everybody feels something when they when they watch either the K-pop industry or the commercial industry. Yeah, it's like the proof is in the impact. You can't yeah. argue with the billions of views that these video get. They're obviously connecting with people. They mean things to people. Exactly. Exactly. And I think I, I phrase that question poorly because it's it unserious is sort of the wrong word. It's more about yeah. a lack of respect. Although mm. I do think I think some of that comes from the fact that K pop in particular in the commercial dance industry generally emphasizes fun. And that is seen as inherently less serious and therefore inherently less worthy of respect. Even though right. That shouldn't be the case because I know mm-hmm. you take your work deadly seriously, even though yeah. what you're doing is inherently fun. Exactly. Um, well, anyway, here's one giant reason everyone should take commercial dance seriously. And that's something that you already touched on, which is that the industry has done a much better job weathering the pandemic than the concert dance world has. There's still commercial work out there mm. happening. So can you talk a little bit more about how the pandemic affected your life and career? How did your life change? And what have you learned over this past pandemic year? Absolutely. Um, I would definitely say the pandemic changed my life tremendously. When it first started, um, I was already kind of like going through a lot, like mentally and like emotionally. And I remember just being on a two week like break, I took a break from everything, everything that had to do a dance. I said, Nope, I'm gonna watch TV, Netflix. <laughs> right. I said, let me just take these two weeks to myself to just kind of process everything that's going on and really figure out the next step in my life. And so, you know, from there, I realized like, Oh my gosh, like, okay, I need to, I need to make something happen for myself. Like I can't wait for these opportunities to come because, you know, like nobody's really providing them anymore in this time. So from there, I just tried my best to um, just live a better life, you know, like working out every day, eating correctly, um, making up more choreography, um, thinking about new ideas for concept videos. And so I felt like that time that we were given where the world shut down really presented us a lot of time to just really work on ourselves Mm -hmm. and, and see things in a different perspective and come up with new creative ideas. Um, So that's definitely one thing that I've been working on this past year also presented me um, a lot of different new creative ways to figure out how I can present dance now through video and how can I showcase my choreography in a special way through video And so that's definitely one thing that I've also been working on through the pandemic. Um, And, you know, it was, it was really cool to see that even through the pandemic, like I said, um, I was doing a lot of K-pop jobs. So a lot of these different groups are uh, inquiring me to make up choreography for the new songs. And that's one thing that definitely kept me afloat. Um, Doing different video projects with the lab Recently, I just did a job with Miss Jennifer Lopez again for the Global Citizen um, Vax Live concert. And that was so cool in itself, just to be able to perform live again in front of a real audience, you know. And even though we still had to wear masks, it was still the fact that everybody kind of got united together. And we were able to just feed off of the, the crowd's energy and everything. That was something that I never felt in a long time. And just so blessed to have witnessed that in person. So. Um, 
you know, even though the pandemic really, I feel like it definitely took a toll on everybody's like mental and emotional state for sure. And, you know, I know that a lot of my friends have lost their jobs or, you know, they had to move back home or uh, I'm still so proud of every single one of us, you know, for just keeping strong and, and just doing what we got to do in the time that we're given right now to hopefully have a better and more successful future. So, and I also have my family here now. They all moved up from Hawaii. So it was just my mom and I living up here in LA for like three years. And now my family, my younger three siblings and my dad, they all live together with us. So it's kind of Yes, for good. Oh, yes. So it's a so nice awesome. reunion with all of us. And yeah, it's just been it's been an up and down roller coaster for sure, but at the end of the day, I just I'm always so thankful. Oh, family helps everything so much. Absolutely. Um, I'm glad that you brought up self care because I feel like because of the intensity of the hustle, as you're describing, a lot of dance artists let that fall by the wayside too much. You know, it's just like that. last on their list of priorities, but that can lead to creative burnout too if you don't take Absolutely. time to take care of yourself. Absolutely. Um, so it is AAPI Heritage Month, and it's this moment of celebration that feels just especially needed after yes. the swell of anti-Asian hate over the past year, especially since the Atlanta shootings. And right. you are part of Instagram's Rethink Our Influence campaign for AAPI yes. Heritage Month, which is so wonderful. Can Thank you talk you. a little about what being a member of this community means to you and why API representation is crucial in the dance industry in particular? Absolutely. Um, for me, being a part of the API community is something that I take so much pride in. Um, I take so much pride in where I come from and who I am because it's what makes me me. And, you know, to be one of the few Polynesian uh, dancers, hip hop dancers in the, the industry and, um, also being one of the few Polynesian choreographers in the industry is something that I like to take pride into because um, I just think that it's so cool to represent my people um, in that aspect. And, you know, for uh, especially where I come from in my culture, not a lot of um, not a, a lot of our people are hip hop dancers. And so uh, it's really cool to to be in this in this community and represent it um, in such a different way. Um, but you know, with everything, with everything going on in the world, you know, it, it's, it breaks my heart to see like that we still have this conflict, um, in 2021. This is like what I always say, because, you know, as a human being, I think that we all have the right to be treated equally, um, and to be treated fairly. And the fact that we still see these, these cycles not being broken, um, this year is, is, it's so heartbreaking. And, um, you know, I love that it it is API month this month to kind of, you know, bring things back into perspective and to celebrate uh, my culture and its people. There's a lot of things that have derived from our people and our culture. And I'm always just so thankful to be a part of uh, just the Asian Pacific Islander community in general. So finally, what dance projects are on the horizon for you like what should we keep an eye out for what's coming soon hmm. <laughs> that you're uh, allowed to talk me. about no you're all good <laughs> um some k-pop jobs here and there that i cannot talk about but <laughs> stay tuned definitely um stay tuned for that and um hopefully just to keep dancing every day and just do what i love but that's definitely what might be happening in the future. Listeners, she just gave me the best wink. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time today. Where can people go to keep up with you and to find out what you're working on? I know your Instagram is huge. Is that the best place to go? Yes, uh, my Instagram for sure is the best place to go. It's uh, Sienna, S-I-E-N-N-A dot Lalau, L-A-L-A-U. And you can go check out all of my stuff on there. That's usually where I post, but I've been kind of bad at posting recently, so I will get better at it. Oh, you're bad at posting is most people's great at posting. Oh. <laughs> so 
<laughs> Thank you again, Sienna. And yeah, looking forward to seeing more of those projects. Yay. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everybody, for listening. I hope you have a beautiful day. And I hope you guys are all doing well in this crazy time that we're in. And I hope that we can all be reunited once again very, very soon. Amen to that. <laughs> Thanks again to Sienna. And by the way, she just joined Misty Copeland's HQ Dance and Activism Challenge, which is a chance for young dancers, I think it's ages 13 to 21, to tell their stories through dance and then also potentially earn prizes. Uh, so you can find out more about that on her Instagram page, which again is at sienna.lalau. All right. Thanks everyone for joining us. We'll be back soon for more discussion of the news that's moving the dance world. Three of us will be back soon. <laughs> keep learning, keep advocating, and keep dancing. Mind how you go, friends. The Dance Edit Podcast is a product of Dance Media, publisher of Dance Magazine, Dance Spirit, Point, Dance Teacher, Dance Business Weekly, and the Dance Edit Newsletter. Our hosts are Courtney Escoyne, Margaret Fuhrer, and Lydia Murray. Our music is by Celestine, with special thanks to Broadway Dance Center for helping us record those footfall sounds. Find out more about The Dance Edit and subscribe to our daily newsletter at thedanceedit.com. Music